Greetings, lovely humans. It's Pride Month. That means that there is some level of desire, drive, determination, other D words, to do some kind of pride thing. This year my pride stuff is going to be a little more low-key and consist of making a thing. This is part of a larger pride-themed thing and various costumers across YouTube are making pride projects, so I will link in the description to that playlist just in case you want to enjoy all that pridey goodness. Um, yeah, I'm gonna make a kirtle. Let's take a minute to talk about kirtles, shall we? According to my research, which to be clear was very much limited by the time and resources available to me, garners that were called kirtles started to appear around the 14th century and stuck around in one form or another until about the 17th century. Now that is a big ass chunk of time. And during that time, there seemed to have been a significant number of variations. There were panelled kirtles that didn't have a waist seam. There were panelled kirtles that did have a waist seam. There were panelled kirtle bodices with a gathered skirt. And there were also variations on other elements. So you could have long sleeves, mid-length sleeves, short sleeves, no sleeves, or detachable sleeves. And I found evidence of kirtles that had boat necks, scoop necks, v necks, and square necks. They could have different types of closures. They were buttoned or they were laced. If they were buttoned, they were buttoned down at the centre front. And if they were laced, they could be laced either at the front, the side, or the back. So essentially, as long as I made a floor length dress with a fitted bodice, I could pretty much make whatever I want and find some historical justification for calling it a kirtle, but instead I decided to base this on a specific kirtle. In my time, in my research hole, I came across a kirtle that is just known as Hjolfsnes 38. It was part of an archaeological find in the 1920s, and part of the reason that I chose that one is there was a nice little diagram of what shapes made up the garment. There aren't many 14th century kirtles still hanging around, seeing as they were all made of linens, cottons, and other natural fibres. Those don't tend to hold up so well over seven and a half centuries, so they're few and far between. Which is why I just decided to base the entire thing I was making on this diagram. Having said that, I did change it up a bit. Hjolfsnes 38 is built using two flat panels at the front and gauze, and two flat panels at the back with gauze. But the placement of the armholes wouldn't work very well on me. Just because of the way my body is shaped, it would be very difficult to use an exact replica of the pattern and have it look even vaguely acceptable on me. So I'm shifting the panels around a little bit so that I essentially end up with princess seams at the front to allow for the extra chestage. I will have a link in the description, by the way, to all of the places I gathered information for this project if you were interested in finding out more or just want to check that I did do my homework. Back to intro, Emily. I'm gonna make a kirtle, a medieval kirtle, and I'm basing it on a pride flag. There are a lot of pride flags that are very beautiful as pride flags, but I think their colour combinations would be reasonably ugly as garments of clothing, so I went searching through every pride flag imaginable until I found one that I thought would work. So the demigirl pride flag is made up of light pink and a couple of greys. I already had light pink fabric. I say fabric. I had a light pink king size duvet cover, which is good enough for me. So I ripped that apart and I had an excellent idea to create a pattern on it, bring it to life, make it more interesting. So I started playing around with various different shapes associated with binary and non-binary genders to see if I could kind of turn them into an interesting pattern that I could tessellate. And I came up with something I was pretty happy with. So I spent some time very carefully drawing that out onto a grid and then using a lino cut kit that Hamish got me for Christmas to carve a stamp that I could use alongside some bleach to create a pattern across my fabric. Didn't really work. The lino cut wasn't deep enough, and the bleach wasn't very good, didn't act very fast. It made no discernible difference to the fabric despite being on it for a couple of hours. Very strange. Usually bleach starts acting immediately and you have to work really quickly. So I decided to try again, and I created my next stamp from a piece of MDF and layers of hot glue applied in a specific pattern, and then like slightly flattened out on the top to try and give me the best surface to stamp with. That stamp worked a lot better. Foolishly, I used the same bleach. I left it on the fabric for literally over 12 hours, and it sort of worked. It's very subtle, but it's what we've got and I've run out of fabric, so we're going with that. Now, about my kirtle pattern. I spent yesterday drafting pieces 
for a bodice that looks like this. I decided just to draft the bodice because it would be a lot simpler to make sure the proportions were right without having to faff around or take into consideration the skirt element. So I now have a panelled bodice pattern that I'm happy with and I just have to translate that into a panelled dress pattern. Yeah. So I set to work tracing the bodice pattern pieces I'd created, marking the waist point, measuring 102 centimetres or 40-ish inches down from the waist, and using a protractor to draw the most exact angle I could down to that newly marked bottom edge of the dress piece. I actually went and bought a children's math set that had a protractor in it so that I could get the angles as precise as possible when I was drafting this pattern because that's the best way I could think of of being like I would like a five degree angle from this place please I don't think I've owned one of these since I was in secondary school maybe primary school thank goodness the pound shops eh I laid out my outer shell fabric and because I was trying to waste as little fabric as possible, I positioned and pinned the pattern pieces so the angles of the skirt section lined up and cutting down the middle between them would leave the correct amount of seam allowance on each piece. The fabric was folded over so I would have two dress panels of each pattern piece I cut, but with seven different panel shapes and all the gauze I had planned, there was quite a lot of cutting out. We're back, and I finished cutting out most of the pieces, but I seem to have somewhat miscalculated and don't have enough of the main fabric I made. Or rather, I don't have enough of the one that turned out well to cut all of my pieces out of. And I may have been being a bit generous when I said slightly miscalculated. I have an entire two dress panels that I couldn't fit on that fabric, and all of the gauze. There are 13 gauze, so I severely miscalculated. Luckily I have the other side of the duvet cover. Although the pattern didn't turn out as well, it does still have a pattern. So I am just gonna use that. I hope it isn't that noticeable. I don't think it will be because I have secondary plans to add more visual interest, which we will get to later. But yeah, I goofed. Also I'm way behind compared to where I wanted to be, as per usual. Oh well. Oh god, those are some, those are some bags. I need to sleep more. Not very good at sleeping. I know you wouldn't think it's a skill, but I am bad at it. I decided to distract myself from my catastrophic miscalculations by diving into my thread box to find a good colour match for the fabric and getting my bobbin prepped for sewing. I had a realisation that makes it sound dramatic. Basically, I realised I only actually need two gauze. If I look at the reference image I was working from for the rough creation of this pattern, there are gauze, but they are only at the front and the back of the garment. The reason I was thinking of adding additional gauze was because of a different kirtle I saw. The reason it had many, many gauze was because all of the panels of the dress were straight panels. So. Because I've created shaped skirt panels, I don't need the gauze. And putting in as many gauze as I was planning to originally is just creating a whole bunch more cutting and sewing for myself. So I'm not gonna do it. I have all the pieces cut that I need to cut, and so I'm just gonna start sewing. That's, yeah, that, that. To avoid any confusion, I decided I would start by sewing each of the front panels to the front gauze and work from the centre front on each side to the centre back and then join the two halves of the dress. The bodice pieces were quite finicky to attach as there were a lot of curves to contend with and I was incredibly grateful I had the forethought to add notches at the waist of each piece as well as any other relevant spots like where the top edge of the front bodice panel connected to the strap piece. But thankfully, once I was past the fiddly curved bits on the bodice, the skirt sections were just really long, straight seams. It didn't give me too much grief. Okay, that was so close. I so nearly caught the gore from the front piece in the seam. I didn't do it. I noticed a folding that shouldn't have folded and I caught it. So I am learning. I learned. I learned from the petticoat debacle. Oh my god, I caught a ruffle. I caught the bottom ruffle. 
but it nearly happened. Also, I feel like I should maybe check my bobbin after this scene, because having just saved myself from that, I feel like the sewing gods are waiting for a moment to trip me up. So I'm gonna check that. I think we're safe for now. With my bobbin status verified, I attached the last two panels of each half of the outer shell and then attached the two halves at the center back seam. Okay, we have a shell, the entire shell of the dress. Very exciting. I need to add the lining for the bodice, but like, it's looking quite floofy and cool and swirly, which is exciting. Right, completely forgot to film everything I did. I pressed the seams, so they're all laying nice and flat. Slightly burned the fabric with the iron, but not particularly badly, and I don't think it'll end up being visible. I hemmed the edge of my bodice lining. I've also put the outer shell up on a hanger so that the seams that are on bias edges along the length of the skirt have a chance to stretch out a bit, which hopefully will speed up the process of finishing off finishing it off. I've just realised that I haven't thought about how I'm going to finish off the seams on the inside of the skirt. Hmm, that may pose a slight issue. Probably should have thought about that, like, at the beginning of all this. Well, bollocks. I don't think midnight's a good time to be trying to figure this out, so I'm going to go to bed. Bedtime for me. We're back. And I've made some decisions that I'm not going to line the dress. Instead, I'm going to fold over and sew down by machine the seams because I don't have enough of the fabric I made this out of to line it, and I don't think I have enough of any other fabric that I want to use that for. Did that make any sense? I'm gonna fold them over and sew them down to hide the raw edges. So what else needs to happen? I need to put the bodice lining in, I need to figure out the hem, and then I need to do the fun bit. Which means I need to drill some holes in some bottle caps, because what else do you do, right? Have I ever mentioned that I can be somewhat impatient sometimes? should just cut up a sheet and make a lining. Yeah, I'm gonna do that instead. So after consulting with Hamish about which bedding he would be willing to sacrifice for the sake of my kirtle, I very haphazardly chalked out my skirt lining pieces using the outer shell and my kirtle pattern pieces as my guide. Because I was too lazy to cut and sew 14 panels and two gores again, I Frankenstein the panels together a bit and cut out six mega panels for the lining instead. I sewed all that together, pinned my bodice lining on top of the skirt lining, and stitched them together. I very carefully pinned the lining and the outer shell to each other around each edge, and sewed along all of them. Went to turn everything the right way out, and promptly realized that I had, in fact, completely buggered up. The lining took so flipping long. I messed the order of the seams up so I couldn't turn it right side out properly. I had to unpick things and redo them and... It's in. There's a hem and a seam to do. There's a load of pressing and a load of top stitching. But I am tired and grumpy and I want a snack. So I'm giving up on this for a bit. I'll press it later. Don't know when later, because it's like eight o'clock. It's taken so long. I started working on the lining at like half two. It's literally taken me all flipping day. I'm so unimpressed with existence right now. I'm gonna go have a snack and a break and hope that peps me up enough to finish this because I still have more stuff to do. Because I decided it'd be a good idea to do something complicated and interesting. Why do I do this? Why? Because I do on some level enjoy it, but it's also very frustrating. Right, snack, break, etc. I've had snack, I've done the pressing, it's time to top stitch. I sped through the top stitching on all the edges of the bodice and the front opening of the kirtle. I then stitched the front centre seam of the skirt closed, making sure that the seam started low enough on the kirtle that I'd actually be able to get my hips through the opening. I trimmed back one side of the seam so I'd be able to fold the wider part over the narrow one and stitch it in place to hide any raw edges, and then I called it a night. 
Okay, so I still have a seam to do the finishing on and I need to hem it. But I want to give the seams that are on the bias as much time as possible to stretch out, so I'm going to wait to hem it and instead I'm going to do the fun thing. I'm going to tie dye this. I'm going to go and dampen my fabric. I'm going to go get my bottles of dye sorted. I've dressed in black, so if I get dye on myself it doesn't matter because I've learned from previous projects spray dye literally everywhere. I'm now dyeing the pink shirt that I was wearing. Fare thee well, pink t-shirt that I really liked. I'm intrigued to see how this is gonna go. I'm excited. <laughs> I tied loops of string as tightly as I could all down the kirtle to try and keep the twist I'd created in place. Then, starting from the top of the straps, rolled it into a little snail shell spiral type shape. The thing to remember with tie-dye is the closer the fabric is to the outside of whatever shape you create, the more saturated with dye it will get, so the more pigmented it will be. I wanted grey across the entire kirtle, but I wanted the bottom of the skirt to be more tie-dyed than the bodice, so I tied the skirt more loosely and then secured that to the best of my ability with a buttload of string. I had marked on my bottles how much hot water and how much dye I needed to add, so the mixture was the correct ratio, and then I just kind of went for it. To be honest, tie-dye is a pretty loose process and you never really know how it's going to turn out, so it's a good time to, you know, embrace chaos. I'm actually going to leave it at that because I don't want to completely ditch the pink. That'll be it, I think. Okay. So the thing has been dyed. It has been sitting for the allotted amount of time and I now need to go rinse it and wash it and all that kind of stuff. But I realise that I don't actually have appropriate things to go under this kirtle. So I've decided to make one out of curtains at the last minute like a ridiculous human. I'm gonna go rinse the thing and wash it and then make a bunch of extra clothes. So I briefly went to war with the string I'd tied ultra tight, taking time to admire my first look at the fruits of my labour. Remove the rest of the string, filled my container with cool water and rinsed away the excess dye. I think I might actually want more, you know. So I mixed up a new, much more diluted batch of my lighter grey dye, tied the kirtle up in a different way, and just chucked a bunch on there. It was very technical. While the second dye was soaking, I ironed and laid out my curtains and cut out some really basic shapes to create a floofy top. Just some rectangles with a few of their corners cut off. I sewed the seams, gathered the neck and cuff end of the sleeve, and added a drawstring at the waist. I also chucked together a really basic underskirt out of two curtain pieces, so big rectangles, gathered to a waistband. I forgot to film the hemming of the kirtle, but it did get hemmed, and then it was time to do eyelets. Now, this took an absolute age because I wanted to put 12 eyelets on each side of the opening, and let me tell you, going through the process of using an awl to create a gap in the fabric's weave, widening it with a chopstick until it was large enough to insert the eyelet piece, and then hammering the bejesus out of it until the eyelet was actually secure 24 times was not my fave. And I will be purchasing some kind of eyelet press for any future eyelet adventures. But with all the garments finished, it was time to get them on, get the kirtle laced up, and go for a frolic in the sun. So yeah, there we go. I'm really happy with how this went and how it turned out. It just looks really cool and it's so comfortable. I genuinely think it might be the most comfortable dress I've ever worn. And I like the top I made. It all turned out pretty well. There are definitely things I would do differently. If I could go back and do it again, I wouldn't bother trying to bleach the fabric. This top added enough white and the bleach damaged the fabric enough that when I was making holes for the eyelets, it kind of did a bit more tearing than I would have liked. Because of that, I think the longevity of the dress may be compromised. 
There are also things I didn't think about, like how I would finish the seams of the skirt. But then I also didn't think about the width of my hips. So I made the front opening of the dress wide enough that when it was completely open I could get the dress over my hips, but I didn't think about the fact that because the lacing was the only closure of it, I would have to undo almost all of the lacing to be able to get the dress over my hips at all, and then lace all of it up again. I got very frustrated with myself about that because I don't know how long the eyelets will last if they have to be used repeatedly and if I'd thought about having to lace and unlace it every time I would have kept the look of the lacing but I would have put in like a zip or something but if I was going to put in a zip I would have constructed the garment completely differently. There were lessons learned. Having said that, I think it looks amazing. <laughs> It fits me incredibly well, and I'm actually really proud of how much my sewing skills have improved. Six months ago I would not have been able to make this from a patterning perspective or I think a construction perspective. And that's really cool to like realise how much you've improved. In fact Hamish pointed it out to me at a point when I was very frustrated and being quite down on myself. I'm really glad that I did the tie-dye. It gives it a really interesting look. Surprisingly dark and gothic. You wouldn't expect tie-dye to be the thing that brings darkness to an outfit, but there you go. I'm not sure how visible it was in the footage, but I had a bunch of flowers pinned into my hair walking through the park. There were multiple children who literally stared at me in awe. I highly recommend dressing like a medieval princess to get children to stare at you in admiration. It is a huge confidence boost. It was a challenging and sometimes frustrating, but ultimately very rewarding project to make. I hope you enjoyed watching me make this thing. I hope that maybe it encourages you to make your own thing. If you want to keep hanging out, then that'd be great, but whether you decide to stick around or not, I hope everything is okay in your world, and I'll see you guys next time. I can't reach, Paul.